I've talked on this channel in the past about how AI and automation and new technologies are going to be displacing a lot of jobs in the future. How, according to a BBC study, up to 30% of jobs are going to completely go away in the next decade. We're about to enter a sea change in our culture because of technology, and a lot of jobs are about to go away. But this has happened before. Technologies have changed in the past, and a lot of very commonplace jobs now completely don't exist anymore. So here's six jobs that no longer exist thanks to technology. First on the list is knocker-ups. Now, a knocker-up is not somebody that you pay to get someone pregnant. It's actually somebody that you pay to come wake you up in the morning. These were wake-up calls before there were things to call on. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, a lot more workers were having to get up earlier instead of like in the ag agricultural era where they would just kind of get up with the sun. They had to get up earlier to go into jobs. And at the time, alarm clocks and watches were still pretty expensive. So for a lot of people, it actually cost a little bit less money to just pay somebody to walk around the neighborhood with a big long stick to tap on doors and windows to wake people up. These were especially popular in industrial towns around Britain and it was not unusual to, you know, be up early in the morning and see people walking around with sticks just tapping on people's windows. Ah, oh, the good old days when you could do that and not be a perv. There were a variety of different ways that people would use to do this. There was one lady actually named Mary Smith who used a pea shooter. She would literally walk around and shoot, you know, pebbles from a pea shooter at people's windows. Imagine that was a good time to be a window replacer. This was mostly popular in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, of course, as alarm clocks became more prevalent, didn't need them anymore. But the last person, the last knocker up actually was doing this in the 1970s. So this actually lasted a really long time. I want to create an app kind of like Uber, but instead of driving people around, it's just people walking around knocking on windows. It'd be the most hipster app of all time. Next up is switchboard operators. All right, so just to set the context for uh, the younger viewers out there, your, your iPhone and Android devices used to not exist. There used to actually be a phone that connected to a wall, a phone with physical buttons or dials that you would spin to actually call the person that you wanted to call. Now that sounds ancient, I know, but before that, you would literally pick up the phone and it would automatically connect you to a person, an operator on the other end, and you would tell that operator who you wanted to talk to. And then they would physically take a cord and plug it in to connect you to the other person that you wanted to talk to. So switchboard operators were literally people that just sat in front of a board of switches all day long and connected calls and took calls from people and made those connections happen. This required them to memorize up to 300 different numbers and extensions to connect people to. And often they received electric shocks when plugging these things in. So that was just a part of being a switchboard operator. Now, if that isn't crazy enough, they actually could listen in on the calls. It actually required them to be on the line when they connected it. So even though the phone companies discouraged them from actually listening in on calls, it happened all the time, unless people connected on a private party line. So today we joke that the FBI or the NSA is listening to our calls, but back in the day, there was literally some third party person that you didn't know listening to your calls. And for that reason, there were laws banning switchboard operators from marrying government officials and police officers and detectives and that kind of thing. So the first switchboard operator was George William Croy in Boston in 1878. This was fulfilled by men usually in the beginning, but it quickly became a predominantly uh, women job because they were considered to be more uh, better able to communicate and also just more friendlier on the phone. Back in the day, they say. Back in World War I, there was actually a unit of female uh, telephone operators that were known as Hello Girls. So that kind of became the name for switchboard operators for a while. People called them Hello Girls. And the last switchboard operator retired in 1983. Her name was Susan Glines from Maine. Next up is elevator operators. Elevator operator. You now we're so used to just getting into an elevator and pressing a button and it magically takes us to that floor with no problems that we forget how complicated that whole system is, that whole automated thing. Uh, that was actually something that took a very long time to come around, but before that, it required a human being to actually be in this car and send it where it needed to go. And this actually required a lot of skill on the part of the elevator operator, was not only uh, ramping up the elevator in speed, going up and going down uh, in a way that didn't make people sick because they could actually control how fast the thing was going, but also they had to line it up perfectly with the floor that they landed on. You know, you don't think about that now. The elevator just stops and you get out and it's perfectly level. Back then, there was a human being that had to adjust it just right and get it so that people could walk out without tripping. Back in the day, department stores that were on multiple floors would have elevator operators that move people up and down. They told people what were on the floors, possibly any specials that were going on that day. Right floor, housewares. And elevator operators often wore white gloves back then because the 
instruments that they handle were brass and white gloves just dealt with brass a little bit better. The skin and the oil on the skin would mess with brass and get all weird. The job mostly phased out in the 60s as automated elevators became a thing, but there are actually still some around. Many industrial and manufacturing sites have specialized industrial elevators that require a human to move it up and down. That's a little bit different. In some towers and touristy areas like the Eiffel Tower, CN Tower, uh, Taipei 101, those have actual elevator operators that sort of serve as, as tour guides as well. But there's still about 50 buildings in New York City that have elevator operators. These are in the more ritzy part of town, the more wealthy people that kind of like to have a little bit more service. They would like to have a person do this for them, I guess. But it kind of is a, a throwback to tradition. And these guys serve more of a concierge role in the building. They, you know, deliver mail and they take care of things for the guests as well. Next on the list is ice cutters. Okay, so this one was so interesting to me, I'm tempted to do an entire video on it because this isn't just a job that went away. This was an entire industry that was pivotal and literally changed the world and no longer exists. So look, if you have the technology to watch this video, you probably have a refrigerator or an ice box of some type where you can just get ice whenever you want. Ice is not an issue anymore. But before refrigeration was a household thing, the world was very different. When you went to the store, you could only really get food for that day or maybe the next couple of days because the food would spoil otherwise. Food couldn't be transported long distances, so everything you ate was nearby or local, which very much limited the kind of foods that you could eat. So what they did back in the day was they actually cut ice from frozen lakes and frozen rivers up north and then transported them down south around the world in insulated packaging. Instead of having a refrigerator at home that used a refrigeration process to cool the inside of it, they had to have ice boxes that were kept cool by giant slabs of ice. I mean, people get in trouble for leaving the refrigerator open now because you're wasting energy. Think about how uh, much of a big deal it was to leave the ice box open when the ice inside of it that was keeping it cool, that was melting every second that, that door was open, had to come from thousands of miles away. So from around 1800 all the way up to the 1950s, there was this massive worldwide ice trade. The ice would be cut from the frozen rivers and lakes, stored in ice houses over the summer that were very well insulated, and shipped out on trains and boats to local ice houses that were then distributed on ice wagons to restaurants and homes and stuff like that. It's just funny to me how little things that we take for granted, like getting ice out of your refrigerator, once took a worldwide global industry to make that happen. And that global worldwide industry and the thousands of people that were employed in it literally doesn't exist anymore. Next up is Link Boys. Fly over any modern city and you see a sea of dots and lights. We have very well lit cities right now, but once upon a time, of course, we didn't. So getting around at night was a pretty perilous thing. I mean, imagine walking home from a pub in pitch blackness with no street lights whatsoever. That was the reality for most of human history. So back in the day before gaslighting became a thing, there was an entire industry around illumination so people could get around at night. And just to illustrate how much different things were back then, people used to schedule things around the full moon, social events, travel, because only under the light of the full moon could they really see and get around. And often generals would move their armies uh, when there wasn't a full moon so that they couldn't be seen. So gas lit street lamps became a thing um, in the mid 1800s, but even that created a job that no longer exists because there were gas lighters that would walk around at dusk lighting all the gas lamps manually. But before that extinct job became a thing, there was another extinct job that existed and they were called Link Boys. Link Boys were people, usually young boys because labor laws, why? Uh, that would basically escort people around with torches so that they could see where they were going. Somebody would come out of a, a theater or something and wanted to walk home, there would be a gang of Link Boys hanging around, they would throw them a farthing or whatever, and they would escort them home. It was like the, the taxi cab of the day. They used torches or what they called links at the time that were made out of pitch and tow, and they would walk them to their house and then they would snuff them out in these little snuffers when they got to the person's house, when they you know, dropped off their fare. They didn't want to keep burning it because that was a, a resource to them. In fact, as you go around London and older buildings, you'll still see little cone uh, snuffers that people would put their links out in. Also, apparently a lot of gangs employed link boys to lead people down uh, dark alleys into traps when they would get mugged, so that was a thing. In fact, the term can't hold a candle sort of came from this practice because it's sort of, if you say that somebody can't hold a candle to somebody else, you're implying that they're not even worthy enough to be a link boy. And last but not least, pen setters. Bowling is, is sort of a blue collar sport. It's not really the most glamorous sport in the world, but it's the one that relies the most, arguably, on technology. 
I mean, think about it. What's the first thing you do after you bowl a frame? You look up at a television so a computer can tell you how you did. I actually took bowling classes in college just for an elective, just for fun, and I still to this day don't know how to keep score. But behind the lane is a complex system of belts and pulleys and conveyors that pick up all the pins and put them back down. They reset them for you so you can just continue bowling uninterrupted. But before all that existed, there were human pin setters. These were usually young men, often children, because again, labor laws, schmaber laws. They would usually sit up on a chair, almost like a lifeguard chair at the back of a bowling alley. When somebody bowls, they would jump down, you know, move the pins out of the way, replace the pins, and they had to do it as fast as possible. So there was a lot of training involved. Uh, there was a lot of apprenticeship in this. It was kind of one of those jobs that any young man or child could go out and get and make a little bit of money and help support his family. In fact, I have a little bit of a personal connection to this because I found out years ago that when my grandfather was a kid, that's what he did. He was a pin setter at a bowling alley. So what I find interesting about all these jobs is they all do something that we all take for granted today, it's something that's automated, something that does not require a human being to do it, but it solves the same problem, but they did it by throwing human beings at it. They did it by just basic brute force human ingenuity and just taking care of it. And I think that's interesting. I think that says something about us as a species. We find a way. We find a way with what we have in front of us. And the things that may seem really weird now made perfect sense back then. My question is, what things do we do now that in 50 or 100 years will look just completely weird to those people? What things do we do now that are someday going to be completely automated and as simple as putting your glass up to a refrigerator and getting ice that now requires thousands of people around the world and someday nobody will be doing this anymore? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Talk about it in the comments below. T-shirts, as always, available in the store. Answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Cool, funny uh, T-shirts that I think you'll enjoy. Thanks so much for watching. If this is your first time here, uh, please check out this video. Google thinks you might like that one. And if you like that one, maybe watch some of the others. And if you do, hey, subscribe. I come back with videos like this every Thursday and more science-related videos every Monday. Thanks again for watching. Now go out there and have an eye-opening rest of the week. And I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.